Welcome to this edition of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Emily Primo, Associate Editor of Fraud Magazine, and I'm joined by Javier Pena and Stephen Murphy. Steve and Javier are retired DEA agents who work together as special agents in Colombia to bring down the notorious Medellin drug cartel led by Pablo Escobar. The hit Netflix show, Narcos, is based on their experiences pursuing Escobar and the Medellin cartel. Thanks for joining me today, Javier and Steve. So then, Javier, could you tell me um, a bit about those three years before Steve got there, what you were working on and how you made those relationships and got the ball rolling. Right, right. It, it, like you said, it was 1988. And uh, I got to mention my, when I was in Austin, my big boss, uh, they call him the ASAC, the system special agent in charge was in San Antonio, a guy by the name of Joe Todd. So he knew me, I knew him, worked a lot of cases, like I said, out of Austin, we answered to San Antonio. So when I got selected, and uh, I was just, I think, two weeks shy of getting to Bogota. My boss from San Antonio, Joe Top, got gets selected as the country at a shade for Colombia, which is the big boss. So we arrive in country at the same time, and uh, I think he, you know he knew I was, you know, basically DEA. You're a worker, you know, you're known for your reputations, you know, and, you know, we're both workers, you know, Steve and I are both good workers, so. I got selected and uh, my boss says, we're gonna sign you the Pablo Escobar case. You know, so I did not know who Pablo Escobar was. I, I had heard of him, but I never dealt with any of his cases. In Austin, we were too far removed. So uh, I started learning. I had a senior partner, but she was uh, leaving country at the time. So uh, I got, you know, and uh, then I worked like what Steve said, Gary Sheridan, then he gets promoted. So I started slowly learning about Pablo Escobar, making my contacts. We had a specialized group of cops in Medellin that we knew from Bogota. I mean, it's all, uh, it all fit into place. Our guys we worked with from Bogota, the cops, some of them were selected to the specialized task force going after Escobar, so I already knew him. So slowly, we started learning who Pablo Escobar was, started learning uh, what he was doing, started learning the violence, you know, the terrorism. Uh, but by working with this specialized group of cops, we knew each other, so they trusted us and, and we trusted them. So it was a great, great uh, working relationship. However, the first search, not like the second one, I would go there maybe two days at a time and then get out. <laughs> I was not supposed to live with the cops. You know, it was only yeah. we'd get there, I'd spend two days, maybe three days, and I'd leave. I'd always stay at the base because of the danger that was uh, going on. Whereas the second search, and we'll talk about this here in a, a little bit, we were actually embedded with the police. We stayed with them. We lived with them, we slept with them, you know, ate with them. So that made a big difference. Yeah. Now, Steve, did, since you were in Miami, did you hear a bit more about Pablo Escobar before you got there? I, was he getting pretty well known at that point? He was. Um, and he really, really started in South Florida. Like he bought a property in Miami in 1980. Um, Harvey and I have been out the property. We actually did a, do a documentary that never made television uh but we were at the old house you know the property he bought in 1980 so he was uh, already well on his way back then but when i got there he can you know pablo and the Medellin cartel control south florida that the cali cartel had no influence whatsoever it was all pablo so if you were involved in the cocaine business in, in any manner at all you were directly or indirectly working with or against the Medellin cartel so our cases all tied back into the Medellin cartel, but I never had a case that got me up to that top level where Pablo was. And I, and I don't think I even got close. So then you go down to Colombia. Did you know you were being tasked to Pablo, to the Medellin cartel and the, and Pablo Escobar, or was it when you got there and you met Javier that you were like, this is what I'm working on? Yeah. You don't know till you get there. So, okay. Uh, you know, I showed up and Javier was already working with a guy named Gary Sheridan and, and uh, Gary and I actually got to be pretty good friends because we had some mutual law enforcement contacts here in the United States. 
And then I got to know Javier through Gary and then Gary got promoted and moved to Barranquilla. And that's when Javier and I became full-time partners. Okay. Um, when we, when you get in the office, they give you a few days to get acclimated. You have to get your embassy security clearances and all that read ons and all this stuff. Uh, but you know, after you're there and you, I mean, I already know who Pablo is. And then I find that these two guys are working him and I'm thinking, wow, I might have a shot to actually work on this case, you know, and, and, uh, and then we just, you know, Javier and I and Gary all just kind of hit it off together as friends. It's yeah. just amazing how the whole thing worked out. Yeah, it sounds like it. So you said that three days later he surrendered himself. What was the plan then for the two of you? When he surrendered, and obviously we did not uh, like that. We were very much against it. And uh, the conditions he surrendered to were just, I mean, it was out of a movie, you know. Uh, basically, I mean, it was good basis for a TV show. <laughs> that, that, I know, and we never <laughs> thought of it. You know what? Back then, somebody mentioned, I hear one of those days somebody's going to do a movie about this. I said, who would want to know about Bob Lesnar? Oh, yeah. it was wrong, right? Anyway, so uh, what he surrendered. It was uh, basically nobody could go into the prison. The, no visitor, no checks. You know, uh, there was no, uh, no control. Took his sicarios with him. Uh, you know, he uh, negotiated five-year prison sentence, and uh, but the, the the main thing, and like I said, was it, it was off, that prison was off limits, and it was by the government of Colombia. Nobody could go close, nobody could go check on it. So it was like, what's going on? We knew that he was going to continue his uh, you know trafficking activities. So basically, that period I think was about a little over a year. We were just monitoring. We started working other cases. Obviously, you know that's where Steve and I hooked up. We, we had, there was a lot of other drug investigations in Colombia. Pablo was not in our in our sights. You know, he surrendered. I said everybody was disappointed, was mad. You know, and obviously you got to be mad. You know, all the people he killed, he killed a lot of, you know, some good friends of ours, uh, all the innocent people. So, but it was part of the plea agreement. And this is, Colombia is their country, it's not our country, so we couldn't do anything about it. So we worked other cases, obviously, for a little over a year. And then until, uh, like you said, that, uh, that fateful night that, uh, that he escaped, that's when Steve and I were there the following, the very next morning, and we're, we were, we arrived at his prison. And it was something out of a, out of a movie material what we discovered inside the prison. What, why is that? What, what was it about it that made it so uh, special? <laughs> yeah, uh, Steve, you wanna, Steve does a good job with. Uh, yeah, it was, um, it, you know what? <laughs> We've been in prisons and uh, all over the world. Yeah. With suspects and so forth. This was the farthest thing from a prison you've ever seen in your life. It was more of a country club. You know, when you when you got to the entrance, there were two sets of green steel bars to, you know, present the fact hey, that, you know, the appearance that this was a prison. But once you got inside that second set of steel bars, it's wide open. You go to the back perimeter of the prison, up on the where the the outer perimeter fence is. There's a hole in the fence, so you can come and go as you please. Um, Pablo was building a series of cabanas and chalets on the hillside behind the <laughs> prison. He was throwing parties up there. I mean, he had plans for the place after his five years in prison. Yeah. So it was just, I mean, it just confirmed everything that we suspected that it's a country club. Um, I mean, the guy had um, in his, he had a two room suite for his prison cell. You know, it had, and you've seen the pictures, I believe it's mm -hmm. he had a microwave oven, refrigerator, freezer. Uh, he had a king size bed. He had a fireplace in his bedroom. He had a jacuzzi tub in his private bathroom. Now, all the prisons I've been in, what they have are called group showers. Yeah. <laughs> so it, was a, it was just a real, real joke uh, what was going on up there. So then why do you think he decided to escape? Well, it, it wasn't uh, that he, de he decided at the last minute. Okay. The, the, the story, I mean, he was there and he had already done like one year. So he's got four more years to go, right? Mm -hmm. And like he said, he had 
chalets, apartments built into the sides of mountains, camouflage. There was something. Uh, and you know what? When you ask the question, what decided uh, for him to escape? It was, you know what? Basically, his ego. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it was. That super, super ego that he had. And uh, the real story is a couple of, uh, he thought a couple of those lieutenants were stealing uh, uh, money from him, which was not true. So he called them into the prison and there were his two favorite lieutenants. And these guys were loved by their underling traffickers. Hmm. They were, in the drug world, they were good bosses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah they, 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 they loved their bosses. However, they, uh, the Sicarios, Pablo Sicarios in Medellin at an old site found some money. It was about $10 million. It was, The money had deteriorated. So they take it to Pablo. And the Sicarios do not like the two lieutenants because it's, you know, jealousy. And they say, hey, boss, they sort of beg you money, boss. Look what your two favorite lieutenants have been holding on you. And they throw the money in front of them, deteriorated. Mm -hmm. And that covered properly. And that incensed Pablo, where he calls those two guys into a meeting, and they had their own security. But Pablo made a point: tell them it's a friendly, friendly meeting. No, no security. I just want to talk to them, see what's going on. So they come in thinking it's you know, and all of a sudden they they see the money, and Pablo just goes ballistic. They're trying to explain to Pablo. They forgot, and you know, the real story is they forgot they buried it, you know. And uh, so Pablo just cannot cannot hold it back. He goes insane, he goes ballistic. And what I've heard from people inside, Pablo himself killed one of them. One of his best friends himself clubbed them, the Carlos killed the other guy. So that information goes back to the government of Colombia, and then they decide, all right, we're going to move him. Oh, okay. They kept the plan kind of quiet. They uh, they kept it real quiet. They surprised Pablo when they went to the prison. Says, "Mr. Escobar, we have to move you." And, and Pablo says, "What do you mean you got to move me? Part of my contract with the government, with the president, is I'm staying here." Yeah. And they said, "No, the president has changed his mind," and that's when it all went to you know what and. Uh, you know, and, and Pablo's trying to call the president in Bogota, who's not answering the phone. So the military guys, there was only about 20, they said. Why 20 guys? Why didn't they send the police? The police would have taken care of business. Anyway, so yeah. there's a firefight, and Pablo walks out of that uh, that door, opens the door, takes about seven, I think, eight Sicarios. You know, he had some money. He took it with him, and, you know, off he goes, uh, like I said, into the night, trying to get, uh, uh, trying to reorganize. And like I said, we get the information, we get the news, we know what's going on. So the very next morning, you know, the, in fact, the government of Colombia asked for us to be, go there in person. And uh, I'm glad uh, we did, because uh, by going there in person, we found firsthand, we saw the evidence firsthand, we saw a lot of what he didn't have time to carry with him, he left behind. So it was good for us that uh, mm -hmm. we were actually there. Okay. Um, to go a little bit off of, uh, I mean, it involves Pablo, but um, kind of the culture in Colombia at the time, what was it like for the Colombian citizens in Medellin and Bogota? Um, cause you hear these stories about how, you know, there were people who loved Pablo because he built homes and pulled people, um, or helped people who were in poverty. But then, you know, Javier, you talked about how much murder happened under him. Um, what was the overall feeling like there? You, you know, uh, in, in, in Medellin, there's, uh, the, the poorer neighborhoods, the poverty neighborhoods, they call them comunas. Uh, in a lot of those young, uh, I mean, kids are called thugs. I mean, they're, they're kids, but they're already learning to be criminals, you know, 13, 14, 15. They, they idolize Pablo Escobar. Mm -hmm. you know, and you talk about it, and we, we talk about it, you know, that Robin Hood, uh, 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 aura that Pablo Escobar had about him, you know, and obviously we dispel that aura. He's <laughs> no Robin Hood. But anyway, so there was a, 
Sicarius idolized Pablo Escobar. They, they were learning, and Pablo was a grandeur type of a guy, you know, back then, you know, drove around with tons of bodyguards. They'd go to clubs, restaurants, they'd close it down, you know, they'd party. Pablo would pick up the tab. Escobar was building uh, soccer fields, schools, homes. So he would help the Sicarios, but then in the end, you know, on the other side of the coin is he he wanted them, and, and they all wanted to work for him. I mean, you'd be surprised as to the amount of people all there. He would have a meeting, uh, and uh, I refer to it as La Terraza, the terrace. Mm -hmm. And it was the old Catholic church. Obviously, we didn't know it was a Catholic church. We found out afterwards. But they'd be, you know, two or three hundred of these kids all wanting there to work for Pablo Escobar. And you know what? Escobar had that charisma. You know, he'd, he'd hug him, he'd kiss him, you know, he'd give him money, he'd build homes so everybody idolized, boss, I'll work for you, I'll kill for you. So it was that attitude that uh, we were uh, dealing with against Pablo Escobar. And at the beginning, people were hiding him. You know, we'd go in and we'd find out later that people, you know, sneaked him out, smuggled him out of an area. They'd warn him. Uh, and during the first search, you know, we didn't have that many uh, people calling in and saying, hey, we know where Pablo Escobar was. Yeah. Nobody wanted to go up against Escobar. It wasn't until the second time that things basically uh, turned around. When he, after his, his... After the, the escape, right. Yeah, okay. But you also talk about uh, Plato of Plomo. What is that, a uh, silver yeah. or lead? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's either the concept is you want a, you want a bullet or you want some money. Mm -hmm. And that briefly explained it, but the, 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 the story, and uh, it wasn't a story, it was, it was a fact, you know, yeah. uh, like I said, Sicario going to the judge's office and basically says, hey, judge, we're being sent by Mr. Pablo Escobar. And in this briefcase, there's, I think it was like $100,000. Back then, 100000 in Colombia was a lot of money. So, judge, all you got to do is drop the charges, and this money is yours. And uh, the judge kicked them out. And then the next day, they killed the judge and his family. So that's where that concept, you know, of the Pablo Escobar's, you know, that that uh, that meanness that uh, yeah. to that you know so that that evolved you want money or you want a bullet and then from there on people started accepting the, those briefcases yeah. you know, and I don't blame them they, I do the same thing take the briefcase money my family's not going to get killed yeah um, and that must have made things really hard for y'all when it came to um, getting any information about him because you talk about not just like the kids who want to be like him and to work for him but then you also have judges and law enforcement and people who are getting paid off um what what was yeah. it like trying to get into his circle get information you know what and i didn't we didn't mention it but at the, at the beginning you know the mistake we we made was we were getting cops to work with us that were from Medellin. Hmm. Uh, I remember a couple of lieutenants at our search block, and then all of a sudden, we'd have great information of where Escobar when he uh, was was at, and when we would get there, Escobar was gone. It was like, wow! I mean, we had a tight seal plan. So later on, we learned, and a couple of guys ended up going, police ended up going to jail. What happened is, Pablo got to their families in mm -hmm. Medellin, so he knew their families. Hey, tell your kid. You know, if you wanna, they wanna see if they wanna see their parents alive. You better, they better start telling me information. So that's what would happen. Yeah. So from there on, we just brought in guys that were from Boa Tower, other besides uh, Medellin, uh, and there was still a lot of lot of corruption with the money. So you really had to know who to trust, who not to trust, who not to give information to. And the good thing was that our our uh, task force that specialized group we had was pretty much controlled after we you know we made mistakes yeah so you said things were a bit different the second time around so what changed when um that year after you got there steve and that um what what made things not easier but you know 
What changed after his escape to, to make investigating him just a little bit easier? Other than the okay. fact that it sounds like you were using police from Bogota um, and you were living, eating everything with them. But can you give me a little bit more about what that was, what life was like then? Well, it was, it was a total commitment at that point because the government, you know, they, this self-surrender program where they allowed him to surrender to his own custom-built prison, that was unheard of anywhere in the world. I mean, that was extremely embarrassing for law enforcement. Uh, the entire government of Columbia was embarrassed for that. But, you know, put you, you know, we challenge our audiences to put yourself in the shoes of the president of Columbia. Can you imagine the pressure he's getting from the public, from the opposite political party, especially, but his own political party. Hey, you went in there saying you're going to stop Pablo Escobar. You're going to stop the murders, the bombings, the indiscriminate killing. What are you going to do about it? You know, you're not doing what you said you're going to do. So the truth is when Pablo surrendered, the bombing stopped. It did stop for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but like Javier told you, it took less than a year for Pablo's uh, ego to get control of him to where he killed Moncada and Galeano brothers and, you know, we're off to the races again. So uh, this time there was a total commitment, not only from the Colombian government, but, but also the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the next day, I mean, hi, like Javier said, we didn't just say, hey, we're going up to Medellin to work. The, the, the government of Colombia called the ambassador and said, hey, we want Pena Murphy up here with us. This has been another edition of Fraud Talk. You can find every episode of Fraud Talk at acfb.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. And be on the lookout for the September-October issue of Fraud Magazine. On September 1st, my full interview with Javier and Steve will be available on fraud-magazine.com. This has been Emily Primo signing off.